Good day, everyone, and welcome to the CAR Aerospike webinar. The title today is The Five Keys to Transforming Data Architectures for the Automotive Market. And this is such a compelling topic. Um, considering what's happening in the world of data, how data is kind of driving everything happening in automotive today, people's experiences in, in the car is data driven, how they're driving, how they how they are interacting with their vehicle, it's all there in the data. And I, the question is, how can we better use that data? How can we use it from an artificial intelligence, machine learning perspective, be able to give the consumer even a better experience? And how can this then translate into vehicle to infrastructure and as we move into autonomy? So I have three speakers with me today that know a lot more about this topic than I do. I'm so pleased to be on the questioning side and I'll introduce them and then I'll hand the stage over to, to let them give us a few words before we start the Q&A. If you have any questions, be sure that you put them um, into the Q&A box or the chat box. I prefer the Q&A box. It's easier for me to just look at one place. So if you do that around 1235-ish, we'll start to utilize some questions from the audience. So um, first today in speaking order, we have Holger Mueller, who's the VP and Principal Analyst for Constellation Research. He covers next generation apps and human capital management, provides strategy and counsel to key clients, including chief information officers, chief technology officers, chief product officers, chief HR officers, investment analysts, venture capitalists, sell side firms and technology buyers. That's a lot of CXOs. On the, um, the following Holger will be Danny bed good and Danny is the global vice president of industry solutions for Aerospike. He joined Aerospike after a 20 year career at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And while he was there, he held many roles from technical sales management, global production management, senior technical consultant to leading global accounts. His main objective was building partnerships with the customer to help them navigate to technology that would meet the ever-changing business climate. He led key in initiatives at HPE that provided global solutions in real-time decision processing to his customers. He pioneered efforts in IoT, edge computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, along with solutions in the automotive market transformation to mobility and ADAS. He holds an EMBA certification in leading digital transformation from Columbia University School of Business. And he will be followed by Greg Tinker, who is the CTO of Annexinet and SVP of Automation. He's responsible for researching, identifying, and applying innovative technologies that drive business outcomes. He's recognized as a leader in the IT industry and has multiple patent filings, Nemours disclosures, and published articles. Prior to his current role, he founded an award-winning IT engineering and services firm, Serene IT, focused on data centers, artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation, and cloud hybrid IT. In 2020, Anexinet acquired Serene IT and appointed him to the board of directors. So I'd like to hand the stage over to Holger to give us a, a presentation about the topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carla. Warm welcome from my side either. Very interesting, glad to be here. I realize my introductions is way too long, so sorry for that. Um, but let's dive right into it. What are the five keys to transforming data architectures for the automotive market, which I assume from your attendees given the sponsors by CAR is something which you're looking into and you're working with. So let's jump right into it and really think about what we're in. We're in the age of disruption. How is this disruption really happening? This is a quick theoretically background on what's really happening is 
in the past, we're really comfortable with figuring out that technology capability was never as good as it was business best practices. So we could say a car driver best practice would require. But the interesting thing is from 2014 onwards, we've seen that technology has surpassed for whatever reason what business best practice do. And we think about four phases, a legacy phase, which are very comfortable with running, an inflection phase where these things are happening, an opportunity phase, often the disruption phase or transformation phase. And then there's going to be some catch ups and maybe sometime business best practice are going to demand more from technology than before. But the quintessential thing is that the speed of your enterprise needs to be faster than the speed in your markets that you can be as comfortable as a gentleman on this famous French lighthouse in front of the Britannicos, where his hands in pockets while on the other side, the waves are crashing in, crashing in, knowing that his enterprise is going to be fast. And what parts of speed are really important? The supply chain speed is in all our minds right now, right? Uh, there's more containers in Long Beach to put them back to back to New York and back to Chicago right now. Nobody knows how it's going to be solved. Human speed is super important important, you can have the best technology in the world, but your people don't come along for the ride. The boardroom speed, the decision management speed is heavily tested in this times in the post pandemic situation, your system speed, that's what we're going to focus on talk about it now. And it all begins at the start of all of this and at the beginning and the start of all of this is something which I call the for the first time we have this infinite computing capabilities. I'm, for instance, in Germany right now, from you should see from my background and from my acts incredible from that infinite connectivity, we just think we can connect with Zoom to everywhere in the world. On top of that, we have infinite insights, which comes more closer to the data aspect of things. And for the first time, you can store all the information without knowing the questions you want to ask. This is all the big data capability. And on top of that, you can run infinite compute. Compute is cheap in the cloud. And with that enables machine learning or artificial intelligence, if you want to believe the marketing part. And that ultimately, that's what we are for the do infinite deep learning, which allows companies to learn from themselves and their own data and enable that. So what are the seven key things to transform your data architecture? Infant insights, I drive on to all of them, the edge, big data, cloud, low code, no code, next generation applications, the AI opportunity, the business model agility opportunity, and ultimately what's really important and in many people's spaces right now, enterprise resilience. So infant insights is the really, really important thing that for the first time, a car company could store all the metric information, all the driving information of a single car for the first time in a way without putting it out of business and just all the cars in the fleet actually, without knowing the questions to ask, right? I was just on the call before, like, should we break for a horse? on the street. Of course, you should do a break for a horse. But what if the AI recognized the horse is on a trailer? Then maybe you just have to deal with the trailer for that. So infinite insights is one of the nine. The edge obviously is super important for us. The edge here is, of course, the driving car or the standing car or the car at rest. It's about big data, being able to store that information, getting that information out of that. It's about the cloud powering the insights for this being the place where to store this information, where you can change. And this is the important thing of cloud. We all know about the technical elasticity. What's really important these days is the commercial elasticity that you only have to pay for what you use. If your business is doing well, congratulations, you're going to spend more for IT. If it's not doing so well, unfortunately, you have to go and spend less for IT. That's what the cloud brings for you. And then there's not enough developers in the world. Every company turns into be a software company. So you have to find the tools which empower your tech savvy business users to become dangerous in a positive way and build their no code, low code applications which help them run their business and put them in charge of their automation destiny. And then you build next generation applications which bring together all these capabilities, data as a service as an example, making sense of what's happening at the edge, changing your inter enterprise functions, revolutionizing your value chains, which you build on top of that. And ultimately all this data, I mentioned this already, is super important to have an artificial intelligence opportunity. We know that the more data you have, the better your AI can be. And AI will go on to win, not only about enterprises and markets, but we know that about state actors as well in the near future. Business model agility is super important. We all got our lessons learned from a small pandemic, a small virus around the world. You have to be able to move to lateral or adjacent business models to be successful. And you have to find this resilience to be like this chemical factory where there's tons of pipes to go from A to B. And hopefully you still have an overview and you can run your enterprise, your value chain as you have. So ultimately, your speed must be faster than that of your markets. You must have platforms which are faster than the speed of your markets because they fuel the speed of your enterprise. You need to be ready for the cloud, no question about this. You need to be ready for artificial intelligence. 
you need to be ready to practice enterprise acceleration and move faster and become more agile as an enterprise. Because ultimately, keep that in mind, software is eating the world. Software is the new fuel which is running everything. Famous quote from Mark Andreessen. Here's my contact information that will stop much, much, much longer. So with that, no further ado, I hand it back to Carl. Thank you, Holger. And, and just quickly, my my uh, you have data is eating the world. I have uh, someone else that said data is the new bacon. So we'll go on to Danny now and, and hear his uh, opening comments. Yeah, thank you, uh, Carla, and, and great job, Holger, for sharing that. Uh, being uh, from HPE for 20 plus years and now on the software side of the business, we may or uh, may be the bacon. So there you go. <laughs> so uh, with that, let me uh, work here real quick. Can you guys see my screen okay? Or is it, uh, hang on one second. One second. We'll get it cleaned up for you. All right, is that better? Yeah. All right, so um, great intro from Carla. Obviously, I uh, kind of shared my background a bit, but uh, I run the Global Vertical Solutions for Aerospike. We uh, focus in financial services, um, telecommunications, and we actually call it Mobility IoT. That's where we kind of uh, um, lean into the uh, CAR and the ADAS solutions that are out today. I led a big uh, venture with that at HPE. I want to share a little bit too. Uh, Aerospike is a member of the AECC. Um, the Automotive Edge Computing Consortium. I think every automaker, manufacturer, software developer is in this consortium. We talk about the edge. We talk about what is the edge and how, we, uh, how, we, how we're going to manage that edge, right? So uh, I want to talk about just these four pillars today, and I'll give you some um, ideas and thoughts that we have and things that we do in this environment as well. So as you know, um, these new types of vehicles are driving lots of data, eight plus terabytes a day. And, and the data and the, and the types of data in the vehicle continue to emerge in different types and qualities and spaces. So the race is how to manage that data, how to move forward with it. You know, what do we do with it? Uh, it's exploding. It's uh, creating what we call data oceans at this point. Data lakes are kind of what we think as ponds. Um, we uh, ingest that data at, at uh, uh, micro second speed, right? Billions of transactions in microseconds is kind of what we deliver and push uh, into the inference engines around those. So we're working in that space uh, today. But with that, it uh, really comes down to the multiple processing and data at the edge. So we want to do as much as we can in the car. Manufacturers are deciding now, where do I do there? What do I process in a car? What do I move out of the car? How do I do policy management in the car? And then we'll talk about something on our next bullet that's kind of very interesting as we as we look at all the data that these autonomous cars and even the mobility devices that people carry into the cars uh, are generating data too. Because you got to realize they're ca we're capturing all that information, not just car data. We're doing uh, parallel parallel correlations across those. Excuse me. Uh, but with that, uh, we move to the second bullet, which is really a hot topic. Um, you know, being uh, in this industry for a while and working with the cars is the data privacy concerns. So your car is generating data. We're sharing that information across a lot of different platforms. Who owns the data? What, would you, what do we do with it? And what are the privacy rules around it? The EU is in the process of generating uh, a lot of uh, regulations. We all know about GDPR and what that means. Um, from our viewpoint, um, there's several, I guess, instances of data lakes and data ingest. We kind of started with you know, rule-based systems. We moved to where we are today in what we call AI ML-based systems. And the edge is kind of moving in a lot of areas in what we call neural nets and deep learning or neural networks. So we're working with customers and, and clients to build out neural networks. So those, those devices actually are supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So they think and breathe on their own and make decisions on their own. So that's a really key topic that, that kind of moves to the next phase of neural networks, which is called explainable AI. All these GDPR rules and regulations that are being put in place today are having compliance issues and they'll have risk mitigation issues that have to be uh, processed. So we need to look through extreme amounts of data and make decisions and reasonings and reports back to a consumer 
back to a manufacturer, back to a supply chain person, or, or an issue with a component in, in almost real time. Before we would go, you know, have months to go research the topic, would find out what data we had, emails, ingest, manufacturing, compliance issues, we'd look at all that, would have months and months and months to gather information, would make a conclusion. The new rules around data are changing rapidly where a customer may say, how did I, uh, how did you decline me on, on a credit app? Or when I was driving and speeding, you know, how do you know that I did that? You have to give me the data to prove to me that I did that. Or even with the insurance app, mobile applications in a car, you know, I had an accident and these kind of things were around me, prove to me that those things happened. That the new rules are, you can't take months to provide that data. You have to do it pretty much in real time and you have to have the company take a view of it and then do their risk mitigation before they present it to the client. So those are real issues that are being faced today. So we see these cars generating all this data, but as you can look at this chart that I've got, which is uh, pretty fancy, um, we move to data lakes at the top where we kind of have data scientists perusing data and looking at it. It has to become real time. Uh, in our world, microseconds do matter. Um, from the edge to the core, to machine learning, to, to processing that information, microseconds are the world that we live in. And we have to provide that back to the customer and to those, to those uh, individuals in a rapid stance. And those rules, again, those timings are, are being defined today. And that'll be our future of data privacy. Um, kind of moving into the next bullet, standards and norms around data gathering use management, and, they, and, and how do we use that continues to evolve. Our involvement with the AECC is very critical to our business because we're creating use cases of how, how do we gather that data? What do we do with it? Where do we parse it? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we monetize it? You know, everybody's worried about how do we monetize that information and data. Um, the cars today, you know, pretty much are scientific kind of cars. We gather all the data. We can pull it off when it goes to a shop. Some of it's pushed out through uh, its uh, cell connections. But over the, over the next generations, we have V to V technology and V to X technology. It'll use DSRC communication. It's using 5G today. I think Honda is one of the first users to do V to V with 5G and private 5G bands that they've, they've uh, built systems around. But that kind of information is what we call policy-based decisions from a database engine that has to be real time. So I have to make a policy decision on that data as do I process it through 5G, do I process it through DSRC, or can it wait till I connect from a different resource? So that's a decision that's made in the, in the database engine itself, which alleviates the application from having to make a, make a choice on it, which speeds up data processing, right? We want that engine to do as much as possible for an application takes it. So we're, we're moving things at, at pretty much instant, instant speed. But over time, those things are evolving and they're evolving very fast. So we're working with several companies in the AECC to help uh, set standards around that. Now, one of the interesting things about, we'll kind of blend in GDPR back into this standards and norms around gathering data. Uh, from country to country, internationally, uh, there's different rules on GDPR. So with that said, I can only transfer a certain amount of information from country to country. So I need a decision engine that can say this kind of information is personal. It can't go from Germany to England. So I need to make that decision. Our core engine does that. We do policy-based management in that, in that database engine. So with that, it translates over to even the US. So in the US, we have insurance carriers that are state to state, they're different. So we need to make policy decisions about the information we share and move across lines. So we do geo tracking, we can put all the information in and know where the car is, what information tracks and moves. But kind of to end the conversation and the, and the topic or kind of bring up maybe more of a question is the last one. The value of this data that's being generated and, and pushed out from these devices, it's still unclear of the usage, how much we should keep, what we should do with it. Um, you know, how is it going to be used in the future? How do I use it to connect to smart cities? Um, we use that concept in a pretty unique way because we're providing that to data scientists and, and other entities to do uh, real-time machine learning, which is a very new thing. Uh, we've got several customers doing this. Instead of looking at a data lake, we pull it in real time and let them look at it in real time. And they still use the data lake as well. But it really comes down to kind of a simple question. How do I make better decisions? 
how does how do how do I as a manufacturer as a user make better decisions? And it kind of breaks into these points. You need to use larger data sets. You need to ingest data from multiple sources. And you can see the car there is kind of our source. I need to ingest data from multiple sources. But in today's world, this must be in real time. And it has to be at petascale. I need to move that data through large ingest engines in the hyperscaler world. So for us, from the edge, edge to the core of the system, from the edge being the car, from the core being the data lake at the top and, and moving through those, microseconds are what we look at and we look at petascale and we're trying to help customers move through that and understand that and and kind of evolve to the next steps of uh, this process so i want to share that probably brought some uh, pretty interesting questions to the table we can answer in just a minute but with that greg i will hand it over to you sir nice job danny all right give me one second here and i'll share out the desktop we'll get started And uh, here it goes. All right, so hey guys, my name again is Greg Tinker. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of NextNet. So a little personal information. I'm not just a technologist, I'm a father. My uh, daughter is 15, my son is uh, now 11. And when I wrote this slide, they were 14 and 10. <laughs> so it changes constantly, right? Um, so uh, with being a technologist, uh, my background in holding patents and stuff, we'll get into that. But at core, I love spending time with the family on the weekend. My son plays baseball. My daughter is a competitive cheer leader. And so we do a lot. I only got four slides, so let's get started. With respect to data, we talked about what to do in the car and things of that nature. I'm going to have three talk tracks, and I'm going to open it up for our Q&A in a few minutes. But on that talk track, we have to worry about how do we handle massive amounts of data, not just from the car. What about outside of the car? What about inside the data center? Fraud detection. This is a real world graph that we have developed. And what we ingest is about 700 terabytes. You heard Danny mention earlier, seven terabytes of data a day just in a car with all that big data analytics. Imagine fraud detection trying to get broken into your corporation at scale. We can do what we do in a car. We can do it across all types of ecosystems and we need high performance databases to handle it. And that's the reason why we work with Aerospike to get that high speed. This example here, 700 terabytes a day. You're talking fraud detection across a plethora of platforms. Imagine everything in your ecosystem. Let's keep it simple. If I have low bouncers, firewalls, logs on SQL servers, Oracle, SAP, Informix, name your favorite. Put all that in there, dump all that data down and build an analytical engine that can determine if it's real fraud or a false positive. You don't want to bog down your NOC staff, your SOC staff. That's important things to understand as we go through in this example of this fraud detection. And I say that because we talk about AI and ML as if there are these magic fairies in the back center and, that, and uh, Skynet is actually real. <laughs> it's not mathematical equation ran at high speeds and and more important it's what we use to build an inference engine and i talk about an inference engine we're talking about cars right imagine a car that's real time measuring all of its surroundings plastic bag or baby you're in a parking lot in a public kroger name your favorite shopping center you're with your family you're in a car be it a tesla or something else Dodge has it, not Dodge, Ford has one now, just announced the Lightning, right? Maybe you have the, uh, what's the Mach-E, right? You have all these sensors, massive amounts of data that have to determine in real time what the object is in front of the automobile. It's how we do that is where the differentiator is. And then that data, and this is going to spur some questions, I'm sure, but back to who owns that data? It's your car, right? You pay the bill. Well, that data has to be able to build an inference engine so that you get a better experience so that the car can determine it's a bag in a parking lot with a little bit of wind coming in front of you. So it doesn't slam on the brakes and throw the whole family into the windshield, right? You want to be able to differentiate that. That's what our engineering staff is constantly working on to make that experience better. And we'll get into these in the Q&A, but I want to make sure that everybody understands we can't do this after the fact. You can't pull all this data down and figure it out and give an answer in 15 minutes. 
you guys drive cars every day. What would happen if you needed six extra seconds? You look down to do a text message. You ram into something, right? You need to know it real time, instantly. And that's what we're trying to achieve in high performance data analysis to build these decision trees, these what's called an inference engine. Now you ask yourself, you're sitting there thinking back, wow, how does all this stuff take into effect? We'll hopefully have some questions here in a few minutes, and I'll be able to give you a little bit more detail about how this actually does take effect in the real world. Whether we're looking at, maybe it's an axle of a train and determining whether or not that axle is over a degree Fahrenheit that the metallurgy can no longer handle. And we're going to have a fatigue failure on an axle and have a train derailment. Does that technology exist? Yes. And we'll tell you all about that cool stuff later. But again, how do we have to make these decisions? We're doing it in real time. Doesn't do me no good to know all the details of how the train crashed after it crashed. No good to know what happened to the car after it crashed and injured someone or worse. We want to know now. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And we're doing this. Um, you guys see it in real world. Uh, you can go to a, an you know, autonomous driving vehicle shop. I don't want to give names, but you guys kind of figure out who I'm talking about. So <laughs> how do we do all this stuff? This is a high-level pictorial. They kind of give you a, more of a concept of where this stuff sits. We talk about a supercompute facility. We're talking about data sources. I'm giving some examples here. This is just data sources. This example here is all about medical. I gave three examples at a high level, and I'm going fast, and I realize that. But at first, I talked about fraud. Second, I talked about the autonomous driving vehicle. Here, I'm talking about medical. I'm talking about pulling data sources in, data sources that, quite honestly, your teenage kids know all about it. Uh, tweets, or it's not really tweets anymore. Now it's uh, Snapchat. <laughs> anyway, pulling a massive amount of data in and being able to determine an inference. Is it a positive context, negative context? What's happening in that real world environment? How do we make it tangible? That's what the big data analytics is doing and pulling this data in. And when we pull this data in, we've got to be able to run it through cleansing data processes. I'm using the example here of Kafka. Lots of ways of doing it. I just want to make sure that you guys understand where the where at a high level this stuff sits. And when we do this data modeling and dumping it down to a decision tree, we need a, a fast database to be able to do that, an in-memory database, so that I don't have to wait 30 minutes to figure something out. I can know now. And now is very, very important as we get closer to utilizing this type of technology in all types of ecosystems. Autonomous driving vehicles are just one example of this. And I don't know about you guys, I want that technology. I leverage that technology today. In fact, I just got off a trip, of which I went about 700 miles. And in those 700 miles, I think I touched the steering wheel about maybe 20 miles out of the entire trip. That doesn't mean I can't pay attention anymore. Doesn't mean that at all. It means that the technology is getting better, we are at the forefront of helping our brethren in arms, be it the manufacturers, name your favorites. We work with these technology companies to help them achieve what we all want, a better experience. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And we leverage the fastest databases in the world, like Aerospike, to be able to achieve those objectives. So I'm hoping I inspired somebody to have a little, uh, few questions and answers. Um, these slides, I'm done with my slide deck. So I'm gonna turn it over to Carla, Carla and let's see if we got some questions that we can answer. Thank you so much. What compelling um, presentations. And I have, of course, tons of questions, but my first one is, is kind of primitive. I, I know you mentioned something about 700 terabytes. And then in the flow chart, I saw, you know, the cleansing. When you talk about that amount of data, that's just overwhelming. How much of that is actual important data that you need? And how much do you just throw aside? And how do you decide what's noise and what's not? That's great questions. So we leveraged our data scientists to figure out that those answers, but at a high level, Mm -hmm. uh, you would be surprised. Majority of the data is not relevant for keeping. It's meant to make a decision and move on. Let me give an example. I, Greg Tinker, log into my bank account. May I'm a Wells Fargo customer. Okay, let's just say that. So when I log in, 
I want that database to actually acknowledge that I'm logging in. Two-factor authentication, the radius mm -hmm. servers, LDAP servers, Active Directory servers have to authenticate this against the load balancers, the F5s, GTM, LTM, all the other favorite acronyms. But let's mm -hmm. don't get all the minutia how it's done. I just want everybody to understand my successful login, is it important? Not really. Yes, we want to keep track of it, maybe for a period of time for governance rules, seven days, but I don't need to keep all the payload data. I just need to keep track that I logged in on this day and it was successful, period. So that's what that cleansing is. I don't need to keep record of how I logged in, where I logged in and all this stuff. All of that was acknowledged. All of that was went through its vetting processes and confirmed. Mm -hmm. I keep just the metadata that this was a successful login. So that's a cleansing component. Now upon a failed login, I want all that trace data. I will know where I logged in, when I logged in, all the details corresponding to that so that mm -hmm. we can then go back and figure out what, what happened, what went wrong. But let me jump in Great. here. If, if I was going to ask Holger next because you yeah. kept saying fast, 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 fast. So what, what, what would you like to add here? You Perfect. You, you raised the most dangerous question in the data area is, <laughs> do we need all the data? That is the most dangerous killing question, which is totally excusable and understandable because in the past, if you were the one footing the bill, Carla, uh, it would cost you more, right? right. So mm -hmm. keep in mind, like fundamental breakthroughs like relational databases were invented to save disk space, right? I mean, yeah. we did research 10 years ago, right? anybody listening, spending time here with us, right? The, the opportunity cost of you doing something in your real job, which you're being paid for instead of learning, hopefully getting some nuggets from us, pays for the rest of your data storage, your data storage for the rest of your life, mm -hmm. right? Averaging out another 40 years, right? And this is with pictures, with social media, storage has become so cheap, so cheap that even asking the question, should I store this or not, is not relevant. Right? Asking the question, am I allowed to store this? Can I use it? Like the examples Danny made before, totally different question. How much trouble do I get into this? But never mm -hmm. ask this question again. And to your example, Greg, great example, right? But I need to know that you logged in from your house today and you got it right on the second time at this time. So when you're 11, 14, 15 year old kid, I don't know, maybe logging in just for fun into this and mistyping a few times, I need to have that digital exhaust, which is completely garbage for most cases, but could be relevant in the shining moment at that moment in time, right? So I agree with you. What, what I agree with you. And most companies keep that, that, that ancillary data, we'll call it, we'll keep right. it for a period of time and we don't need mm -hmm. to keep it forever. But on the same question, Carla, let's say that car that I was telling you about took a photograph and, and it measured that data. Okay, then it begs the question, whose actual data is that? My car. That's a great question. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's going to get real that's, tricky. That's my that's sort of coming up question. So first, I want to see if Danny had any um, comments well, on my first question, and then I'll move on. Yeah, just just a couple of points. So so in the past, we we took a lot of data exhaust. We took a lot of what we thought was insignificant data, and we just flushed it. Right? We just I can't store it. I can't keep it. I'm flushing it with what the topic I brought up about GDPR and, and with, this was a couple of years ago with some automakers, we were, we we're in a symposium, we we're talking about it. I hate to say this, they're keeping all the data. They're keeping even the noise because at some point the noise may be valuable. We, we kind of did an analysis. Uh, Google today is the largest data repository at about 23 exabytes. Um, the data that we projected for one automaker was 127 exabytes in five years. That's the okay. data. Okay, for, for everyone who's who's not as smart as you are, how many zeros is an exabyte? I'm gonna ask Greg. I don't really ten know. Ten to the what? Right. Because a zettabyte <laughs> no, exactly. is ten to the seventeenth yeah. or something like that. So what's an You're exabyte? You're gonna get carpal tunnel as you write out those zeros. <laughs> yes, you will. Yes, you will. Uh, so it it's it's enormous. And you know, Google, everything you do on Google, they keep. They don't even ask if they want it or not. They store every even your mistypes, they keep. So Google keeps everything. So everybody's going to this Google model. I'm keeping everything because I just don't know what the future. And Holger made a great okay. point. Storage is getting way cheaper, especially now with yeah. web scale and yeah. S3. Yeah. I'll turn it back over to Holger. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Well, storage is so cheap that you really don't want to say this question. Do we want to ask it? Right? Because data, which is 
trashed and not worth it, whatever, for like 364 days on 365 days, it might save your enterprise, right? So this is why you don't want to throw data away anymore, right? And I always yeah. use like, what's in one man's eye or one lady's eye is uh, trash is the gold in another person's eye at a different time, right? So don't, don't throw that data away, especially if you bring it back to cars where it comes to back to consumption, right? I mean, if you think about you throw away for an average five-year-old car, the outdoor temperature when you start that car, you have a recall, right? And the recalls are kind of like uh, get everybody mm -hmm. at the same time who comes in first and so on. But think about if you could redo this, and these are the people who really need this. This is the cars which might break down sooner. This is where you have a worse customer driver experience because of because you have this body of information. And who would have thought that a car would break down because of short circuit in a cheap component, which we never thought about, but is temperature sensitive or humidity sensitive or mm -hmm. abuse sensitive, whatever, if you drive on a bad road, right? Collect the data in order to have better customer driver people experiences, right? So don't yeah. throw the data away anymore. Yeah, and that's such a converse way to think about it, because throughout my whole career, we ran out of space and told people you got to get rid of everything, you know, purge what you can because we're out of space. But right. you're completely right. Now that you have the data lakes and all the cloud services, you can put as much as you want up there. And so you, know, I, I, you should. Right. It's, 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 it's if you don't have that data and your competitor has the data and mm -hmm. they have a better recall, not they the have the edge. Then, mm -hmm. then you say, why don't we have this data? And it's yeah. too late. It's too late. Yeah, yeah. And from a knowledge management standpoint, it really it really reduces your your risk, I suppose. Well, I, and I'll add on, on Holger, keeping the data and doing nothing with it. That's the worst. You basically spinning. You're not doing what you should be doing with the data. You've got to be leveraging that data to go forward, keeping it, doing nothing with it, putting it in tape, going in Iron Mountain and not taking that in that not doing any actual the investment on that data and that's where mm -hmm. the danger zone really starts and, and and keep in mind the car manufacturer is completely disenfranchised from how his products are being used the car was being bought it's driven off the lot and you're going into a dark hole right and if you're lucky the car is going to be serviced right on right. great right? we can download something on the car service on something which was designed 30 years ago so right. it doesn't have the driving data of until the last service no it has a driving right. data of the last seven days Right? In the last seven days, the car wasn't driven. So it's not telling the service technician anything. And then they're going to throw that data even away. Right. So if you mm -hmm. want to know what your customers are doing with your product, in this case is the car, you have to find the ways to capture more data and enrich that data. Right. We right. Are mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, right? Uh, I remember uh, many years ago, uh, many of the German manufacturers saying, oh, we don't need the Google Maps and Waze. We just know where our cars are driving. We're going to give people a Waze like experience. They completely failed because they were not ready to capture the data. They weren't ready to work on the cloud side. And theoretically, right. conceptually, they could have right but they fail on that experience now they have to buy that data or get constant of the data to capture the data where did people drive around with my product my car and i can't make that product better i can't give user statistics i can't say here's your better lease offer because guys price went up or down or, right. or electric charging is coming like that there's i mean a marketing person's bonanza is in that data basically and the success or not success of anybody doing this right right so this is why this conversation about who owns the data Yes, yeah. very important. We can't tell you manipulate the data, use the data, no matter if people agreed or not, right? This is an official grown-up webinar. But if somebody has an advantage by taking that data and bringing that data, nobody's going to care, especially right. if the yeah. driver, the user is delighted. Oh, thank you for correcting my typo. I do all the time, Google, because you captured it 20 times. And then you said, well, I'm just going to correct the way I use type something as an example of something we know from the consumer world. Yeah, yeah I, was, totally agree. I was just going to I was just going to end with this. We, we talk about this data a lot in a lot of groups that we're in, and it's been referred to as the new gold rush of the 1800s. Keep it all and keep digging. Yeah, <laughs> well, you never know what's going to come. You, you never know the value that you're going to glean from that data. The technology that we have today. Imagine wind that clock back five years ago. Let me give you a quick example. We have a client right now that has a little over 20 petabytes of capacity of data, just actual data, it's actual uh, insurance data. Let's don't get into minutia, but they have insurance data and mm -hmm. they know all the types of trends that, that that data, they have all of it, who got insurance, what was being insured, age brackets, all this good stuff, but it's all being archived on tape, ouch, all archived off the middle of nowhere. So they have all this data that cost them a lot of money because it ain't cheap to store stuff in a vault somewhere. 
So what we've encouraged them to do is here's what we're going to do. We're going to pull all that data out, put it on web scale to Holger's point, storage is cheap, but moving it over here is not in value. Not, that's not that valuable. Okay. What is valuable? What if I were to take all that historical data, pull out the intangibles, and now you have a whole new product stream and you can sell mm -hmm. that intellectual mm -hmm. data. Maybe, maybe you're an insurance company and you want to sell your cool stuff to a data company. I won't give names. Trust me, they exist. <laughs> My point of that story is we're giving companies taking their data that they have and making it valuable again. That's mm -hmm. technology that quite honestly, you couldn't do five years ago, six years ago. Now you can. And it's all because of the high speed. My examples here, I, mean, I know we're talking about automotive, but it's, it's automotive is really what's busting through these, these walls that we've had for a number of years. I mean, honestly, eight, you know, eight years ago, autonomous driving, we all joked about it. 10 years ago, this thing, remember that? You had to flip out and you had to use a keyboard. It's miserable. <laughs> so we're making major advancements mm -hmm. in technology yeah, that, quite good. frankly, I'm excited for the next five years. It's going to be really cool. Yep. Yeah, and the speed at which is, is happening is amazing. I know that uh, a few years ago when I talk with different companies, they would say I'm inundated with data. I don't know what to do with all this data. Right. And because of that, as you rightly said, it was just going on the shelf and nobody was utilizing it. And that that's just a sin. Now, let me ask the next question that we kind of keep jumping around. And that is one that came from the audience and one I think you've all mentioned the data coming from the car, who owns it? Who's responsible for it? And who can actually use it? Well, that's that's a, a everybody can chime in. We're all smiling. <laughs> I've got to go first. That is a debate that will not end in a good spot, I'm sure. So so I, I've, I see the question is like, who owns it? Me, the owner of the vehicle or the manufacturer? So there's a lot of questions that have popped up. If you financed it, do you really own the car yet? Does the manufacturer still own the car? If you paid cash for it, do you own the data? But the systems in the car were designed and engineered by the car manufacturer, so they're collecting it. So is it really their data and not your data? So mm -hmm. I have to tell you, there are multiple committees with a lot of legal inference, I won't use the word I was going to use, in that group that's trying to decide who owns what data. And with GDPR, which we're, we're pretty much doing, uh, kind of looking at that a whole different way, with these policy engines and things, um, where do you go with that? Who really does own that data, right? And as the future unfolds, I have to say that it's leaning a lot into the user space, like us as the owner, but then we have to define, do you really own it? Who really owns it? Does the bank own the car or do you own the car? Does the, and if it's a finance yeah. outside of the manufacturer, does the bank own the data, right? So those are all questions that we're working through today. So I'll, I'll and, hand that and off. And what to about the too. data too, that the cities get from the vehicles, yeah. from their equipment? You know, there's just data is going everywhere. Sorry, yeah. go ahead, um, yeah. Greg Holger, or what you Well, I was going to ask Holger, what you think? So the, the question is not really who owns the data. The question is, who wants to have the data and can create value from the data. But me as an owner, I might own the data, but I'm never gonna find out something important there, out of that, right. right? Because I don't have the capabilities to process it, right? It might be nice to see where I'm going, but I don't even need the car for that, right? So the car manufacturer is the one who wants to own the data and can and needs to do something with the data because otherwise they will be disrupted. And I know it's new and sensitive on the car side, but look at what's happening in software. Right, where we don't have, it's all software anyway, right? If you peel down the detailed fine print, software vendors are always allowed pretty much every time to, to capture what you're doing to improve the experience. Now, what a revolutionary concept, right? Who right. would not agree that to improve my driving experience, right? My car manufacturer can store some data, keep some data. And if they really improve my drive experience by saying, hey, Olga, uh, you should drive slower there. You should change your fuel mix. You should get new tires. And I can see the savings out of that or they make it better for me. Uh, no brainer, right? I have no problem to opt in if every month they ask me to opt in, right? But if you're from a vendor side listening today, right? The number one job you have to do in the future of data is to get the data and change the fine print that users, people have to opt out. And by default, it's opt in and you have the capability mm -hmm. to capture the data and get the insights. Yeah, I agree with Holger on that. You know, the value, the actual value, everyone wants to know how much is my, da my data worth? Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. My car, for example, um, I, I drive an auto autonomous driving vehicle. It's not fully autonomous. We all kind of know that. I'm not going to go into that detail right now. But let's just say I have a lot of data in my car right now. And that data, to Holger's point, I, I own that data. Let's just say that. 
what value is that that I'm going to provide to that data? I don't own the intellectual engines at, and I'll just name the manufacturer, Tesla. I don't own that. I don't have access to that system. And so I could sell that data that I have in my car to them. What's it really worth? 25 cents. Okay, I'm sure somebody's going to cut that one time and take that out of context. It's going to hit major headline news. <laughs> Greg says 25 cents. <laughs> so, all right. With that being said, though, don't worry about the dollar amount being on the data. It's a big, mm-hmm. that goes back to Holger's point. I, me individually, I can't do anything with that data. I want my manufacturer, somebody I trust in that has made a product that I really like. I want that experience to be better. And if I can help them make that experience better, I want to be able to opt in to that. Ex- and mm-hmm. so I can be a part of that success story. And quite frankly, they'll probably, you know, one of these days, that's for manufacturer to make that decision. Maybe when you get ready for a newer car, you get a little bit of a discount, maybe whatever. Thank you for mm-hmm. giving my data back to me so we can make your experience better. We, I don't know how that's all going to play out, but long story short, that's a lot of lawyer talk. <laughs> we'll let them figure mm-hmm. it out. It so, it so the theme that I'm kind of hearing is, you know, from a personal standpoint, that as long as you get some value in your experience or some improvement in your experience, then that would be the one way that people may choose to opt in without this fear of right. cyber or fear of using my data illegally or knowing that I, well, it I gets don't know, even more complicated bought, if your bought car... wrong when I was 12. You know, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it gets even more complicated. If your car was at the scene of a crime, you or me not in it, maybe it just happened in front of you and my high def right. cameras on my car videotaped it. Wouldn't law enforcement like to know that? Wouldn't you want to do your civic job to actually help your citizen that got injured or whatever mm-hmm, happened mm-hmm. in that situation? So, you know, there's a lot of, it's not a simple answer. Right. But on the flip side of the coin, I dare say if most people step back and think of it from a, a betterment of society and end user experience position. It's not that hard of an answer. It's my opinion. Now, let me also ask with all this data that we're gathering, how is that going to actually, you know, spearhead or improve um, going from ADAS to, let's say, some level of autonomy? You know, how, how is this analysis and process going to going to help that by the AI and machine learning? I'll go first and then I'll uh, flip over to Holger. But uh, so uh, you're, you're asking the data coming in, how's it going to make my, how am I going to get to that next level of autonomous driving, right? Right. How am I processing yeah. it faster, yeah. smoother, smarter? Sure. Sure. So that, so you know, going to, uh, let, let me just you. give, give okay. a little context first. Sure. I remember ages ago seeing the video, the famous duck video, video of the old lady in the wheelchair and the duck, right? From Google. You know, and that was one case the car had never seen. So it just sat there and it's, you know, LIDAR went and couldn't do anything because it couldn't make heads or tails out of it. That's just one case. You know, there are untold numbers of those cases, right? So how can this kind of platform, you know, take a case like that, make sense out of it, maybe apply it to another case so that, you know, the, the learning curve just gets faster and faster and faster. That's, sure. I think, my basic question here. High level it. Um, going to autonomous level driving from a uh, car not knowing anything to being successful. Let's, let's, let me explain it simple. Um, interstates, interstate driving, mm-hmm. that can be autonomous driving fairly easy. Why? You don't have to stop. It, it's straight line roads, well paid, well lit. It's That is not that hard. We're probably about 97% achieving 100% autonomous level on an interstate or high level main road Autobahn in Germany, for example. We're about, I'd say 98% there. Very few things can disrupt a car in that space. I'm a prime example of this. I just did 700 miles on interstate. I already told everybody, it's pretty straightforward. Where it is not is on backcountry roads. This is where you have roundabouts or uh, poor lighting conditions on l- roads or the lines no longer exist. You're in the pea gravel. Y'all know what I'm talking about in the South. We got a tar and gravel road. Those are horrible or dirt mm-hmm. roads. Now you've got a whole bunch of exceptions or out, what we call mm-hmm. outliers. It's mm-hmm. the outliers that are going to make it almost impossible to make a hundred percent autonomous vehicle everywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. So in, with that being said, how do we fix that problem? Data. The car data, the drivers, the drive, you have to drive it. And that's how an inference engine works. An inference engine is not a, a, a mind that is actually coming up with cool thought process. That's not how it works. How it works is we have data, 
We measure the surrounding environmental conditions around us, temperature, light, you know, depth, whatnot, all the objects, we measure it. And then we say, we see this, and this is the outcome from it, okay? We got to do that millions and millions of times, right? hundreds of millions of times. And we have to do that on every road that exists in every area. Don't care where you are, Germany, Sweden, name your favorite, all the way across the U.S. It has to be done everywhere. And then we'll get closer to achieving that objective. But it all goes back to data, massive amounts of data. Holger, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, if you were in a self-driving car uh, to what level, whatever, would you not say, I'm happy to share the data to make my driving experience better, which will be augmented out of crowdsourcing that data for someone who has the capability, who doesn't throw it away and so on and find something of it. I mean, it's almost a no-brainer to opt into this, right? And we are so familiar to opt into it because look, we're driving with our smartphones in the car and we've opted in all kinds of stuff, right? Why would a Facebook user be worried about sharing their car driving information because they're liberally sharing anyway, where they're going, where they're taking pictures, what they like, what they don't like, right? So there's a kind of like schizophrenic world which often is taken as an excuse by, in this case, we're talking about car manufacturers because they're not there and they're so far away from it, right? They, they lost the control of the navigation dashboard, right? It's been replaced by, by Apple a CarPlay on by Android Auto and so on, right? It's gone to the smartphone and it's because the platform itself has not been realized to be an information platform, right? The CPUs right, right. being used are so slow. I'm not going to mention which rental car I have right now in Germany. <laughs> and I have to go for a tricky old, um, in my brother's house from 750, it's super difficult driving backwards out of a small driveway, right? I'm doing this mm -hmm. with mirrors forgetting the distance system because the CPUs they're using are so slow that when I'm out there in 20 seconds, then they start waking up and telling me if I'm close to something, right? So, so this is what has to change from a car manufacturer perspective that not only keeping the data, right, but the way how can I ingest the data and I can make the experience of this platform better, right? Why has no car manufacturer come up with an advertising paid navigation system? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. One minute advertisement video, give a free navigation system running for the trip or for one hour or whatever. And then mm -hmm. we will play it next time before if you go longer than this, right? Why is this creative thinking not happening in the car? That's a big question just, to me. Yeah, and just to your point too, Carl, how does it happen faster? How do we get to mm -hmm. that goal faster, right? So obviously more data is the answer, but how do we get that data and how do we share that data and how do we how do we build common standards and practices around that right so today we have some automakers that are gathering that data making that dirt road or or pebble road look clearer and as they mm -hmm. gather the data it becomes clearer think of it as kind of your monitor you hit 480p and now we're at 1080 and more data we get more pixels we get the clearer the vision is but the next step to that is really V to V technology, right? So this mm -hmm. vehicle down, down this road and I'm right behind them and I'm a different manufacturer. That's a key point. And that car in front of me is reading that information and it's making inferences and decisions. I can share that with a guy behind me two miles and go, oh, by the way, this road is getting a little dicey. So the engines pick up, things kind of change in the car, you know, things kind of happen. So those are kind of the next steps with V to V technology. And then obviously from there, as we go V to X, which is multiple data sources. And that's kind of what we see too, is as we ingest multiple data sources, I need to be in real time because I can't feed it to a guy a mile behind me if I'm not really doing that in real time. So that's yeah. how we proliferate it. That's how this whole infrastructure of ADAS driving and mobility, even, even with our smartphones and how we connect is gonna evolve, right? That's how that's gonna move forward. And, and again, what you do in the core and how you move the data is key, right? Spot like on. You said earlier, yeah. keep all the data. We got to keep it all. So yeah, yeah, the and the speed of the CPUs and stuff are going to be crazy fast, right? I mean, you guys all remember ten years ago. I mean, look, look at all the crap we run on these phones these days, right? This thing's crazy powerful. Look, let me give you an example. That's my favorite calculator. That thing is <laughs> twenty something years old and it's slow as molasses. But of course, from like HP. course from HP. Reverse pull. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, but my whole point of that story is that calculator. I mean, this phone can run circles around any of that technology in our cars today. Like Holger mentioned, um, manufacturers are going to have to put a certain dollar amount of compute investment in every car. The computer is going to have to be in. There's going to be a small server, and that server is going to have to have a lot of compute power 
so that it can do that inference engines and look at that analytical data in real time. And then at nighttime, it's going to go to the house. It's going to be on the Wi-Fi, maybe on 3G, whatever cellular service you have. It's got to upload to a central repository so that the manufacturer can take that data and then disseminate that back down so mm -hmm. that the user experience is to all the users. That's, mm -hmm. that's what has to happen. Yeah. So Holger, let me let me go back to you because I particularly caught into your, or caught onto your sentence about why don't they do this? You know, I think it's something the automotive industry struggled with for a long time. Keep it simple, make it a great experience. I mean, make it like a you know like you're interacting with your phone. So why are so many companies struggling? You know, when it comes to transformation of their of their data architecture. That's a great question. I, I think to me, the core is that they don't realize that they have to be software companies. The competition, the, 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 their competence is no longer in building cars or manufacturing or shipping something because that by itself is such a consuming process that they think, oh my God, I have to move to the electric car faster than the other guys because I might not have a car if I don't do this, if electric cars mm -hmm, are the next mm -hmm. big thing, right? And over that, they forget what is really the competence in this current era where software is eating the world to quote Mark Andreessen mm -hmm. one more time, right? But where software transforms the experience, right? What we keep forgetting here, and I always use with people saying like think of yourself and the self-driving car and we all are bound to this operator model that we're in the mm -hmm. car and hey look mm -hmm. hands free i don't have to drive no that's not the benefit of the self-driving car the self-driving car is the car which brings the kids to that afternoon activity or picks them up from school which gets delivery food which finds the parking spot while we're walking in the restaurant or the movie cinema right that's the benefit of the self-driving car which requires a totally different assisted non-assisted part so we keep thinking in this operator model and again, infinite computing allows us to have things running 24 by 7, not on this human level of we have a good day, a bad day, and so on, right? But it, it, it is, doesn't have, the human doesn't have to show up anymore to do things right. And that the core car companies and many other industries have to realize that they need to start thinking and operating mm -hmm. like software companies. And your that sentence, I think, says a lot because anybody who looks at the data knows that about 25% of people are not even driving a car anymore before they buy it. They right. do want to know how their phone connects and, and can they manage things like that. Sure. But I mean, it's all about software. So, right. you know, this, this is going to be that experience is going to be the brand identity of the companies in the future. So I've only, we've only got four minutes. So I want to give you each about a minute with your, you know, concluding thoughts you know, about companies that, that want to do a better job here. Um, you know, one of the questions is always, do I have to do this massive system? How can I start small and get benefits and then continue to get better? So I'll start it with Holger since you're on my screen and then, uh, uh, then it can go to Danny and then I'll let Greg close it out. I think I have to disappoint the question. There is no starting small, right? One of the reasons... Google is what Google is today because they right away said we have to solve internet scale questions and problems and benefits, right? And it was always solutions for the internet. Had Google said, we're going to start with what runs in Silicon Valley or in California, they would have been overtaken by somebody else, right? There has to be an understanding that data is essential for running the future, no matter what business you're in. Software mm -hmm. is what gets the competition, com the competence out of the data. And you have to start applying across your whole product value chain. The sooner, the better. Otherwise, you get disrupted. Thank you. Holger, Danny. Yeah, so in our world, um, and then what we deal with is, is uh, quite different. Um, we talked about it earlier, all the data, keep it all but utilizing that data and then having that data in, at real speed, at real time inferencing. We look at the auto industry and a lot of companies have coined it as a paradigm shift. It's a whole new world. It's, it's almost like the internet coming in a new angle and it's a whole new growth, but data is the source of that. You know, data is the core. We actually say data is the new money in the automobile uh, manufacturing. It's the new way for them to, to evolve to the next step. It's not the car. It's the user experience and how do I improve that? Data is the core and that's where I'm going to learn from and that's where I'm going to deliver to the customer. So, Thank you. And Greg, I'll let you close out. Thanks, Carla. The, uh, I'll tell everybody, uh, you got to think outside the box. You got to be open to a new way of looking at your data and looking at how your data brings value. 
We've uh, we've been in a legacy mode for a long time. A lot of companies. Look, you'd be surprised if you can step back and think outside that box. There's more Elon Musk and Richard Branson's in this uh, in this world than those two guys. Well, I want you to sit back, and I need you guys to think about. You look at your data. Look at your platform. It doesn't matter if you're in medical, manufacturing, IT. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. You have a lot of data. The question is, how can you leverage that data? to build a better business outcome. Yeah, I think that's that's the big question. I appreciate you closing with that because you know, there's been a lot of talk about data in the vehicle, it being worth $3 trillion. I think we've seen a lot of mobility as a service and things like that start hoping to you know, monetize that data. But I think if you're missing that first part of having all that data that's optimized so that you're in, that you're constantly reviewing it and improving and assessing, just starting something is not going to end up positively. So it's that continuous um, loop. And the other thing I heard was keep it all, keep it all. You know, even if you don't use it immediately, it's there because you may need it at one point. So thank you, Holger, Danny, and Greg for your time today. Thanks to those who joined us. Um, on this recording, and I hope that everybody has a great remainder of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.